Welcome to the Financial Flossing Podcast with Ross Brannan, guiding dental professionals to a brighter future. Ross Brannan is a financial advisor who knows it's not just about your teeth. He helps dental practice owners protect and maximize today's cash flow to plan for tomorrow's cash needs. Find him at rossbrannan.com. On the show, he brings together experts to help dental professionals looking to make smart money decisions to grow their income, turn their retirement goals into reality, and improve their lives. And now, here's your host, Ross Brannan. Welcome to the show. My guest today is Daniel Baker. Daniel is a dentist who purchased a practice right of residency and is in his second year of ownership. He is passionate about getting out of debt and achieving financial freedom while maintaining a work-life balance. Today, he joins us on Financial Flossing. Daniel, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Ross. I appreciate you having me on here. I'm excited. Sure, sure thing. So this is a little bit of a change up. Typically, we have more experienced dentists. Typically, we have people who work with the dental industry, whether it's a tax planning CPA, whether it's a bookkeeping company, whether it's a DSO guy. But today we're talking to you and you are a relatively new dentist, meaning out of residency only a couple of years, you bought a practice right out of residency. And I think this is a phenomenal opportunity to share with our listeners, because I know we have a lot of young listeners on what that world is like. So let's start with how did you become a dentist? What, what ended up happening? Well, I am, uh, I'm from Georgia originally, went to University of Georgia, go dogs, and I decided I wanted to do something in healthcare, but still enjoyed the business side and figured out that dentistry was a perfect match for me. So I went to dental school up at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond and decided very quickly that I did not want to specialize and love general dentistry and the thought of owning a business. So kind of pursued that avenue, um, learned as much as I could and figured out I wanted to own a practice as soon as I I possibly could. That's great. So tell me what made you decide to jump into ownership of buying a practice right away instead of starting out as an associate somewhere? It would be a couple factors. I think number one is looking at my student loan debt and realizing, hey, that number is really big. And as an associate, the thought of trying to make payments on that for 15, 20, 25 years was terrifying. Um, I knew that as an owner, I would have a lot more flexibility financially. I'd be on track to maybe achieve financial independence sooner than I would normally. And then as I kept pursuing that, I figured out I actually really enjoyed it. I like the thought of creating my own schedule and building this practice to, to do the type of dentistry that I want to do. All right. That's cool. So tell the people a little bit about your student loan story. I thought that was really interesting how that was a, uh, you kind of got punched in the gut a little bit in that scenario. Well, I had initially, I had this great plan. I thought I was going to be a military dentist. I applied for the HPSP scholarship twice and got turned down twice. But at that time I had already committed to go out of state for dental school, um, not realizing that if I didn't get this scholarship, it was going to be a kick in the gut. And I'll be open and honest, I have $550,000 in student loan debt from just living expenses, not nothing extravagant, just high tuition. So that's kind of my, my burden now. But it is a burden, but because you chose to own a practice, to buy a practice, and because you've grown that practice relatively quickly, would it be fair to say that while the student loan debt is annoying, the payments are not strangling you from a cash flow standpoint. Yes, I would say that's very accurate. I thought about the associate route making a certain amount of money, and it sounds like a great number. But then when you break down how much you have to pay a month in student loans, all these other things you have to pay, at the end of the day, your take home is significantly lower than what you think it's going to be. Whereas as an owner, ideally you would have a higher income so you can bring more home monthly. So even though you have these high student loan payments, what you get to live on and the flexibility you have with that leftover money is a lot better. So I, I'm very grateful that I went down this route. So talk about the process of buying a practice right out of residency. <laughs> I mean, how did you find it? Was it hard to get financing? Is it bank finance? Is it seller finance? How, how did all that work out? So I started looking probably about three months into residency, trying to plan ahead. And when I was in residency it was 2019, 2020. I had found this practice through the VDA classifieds. Oh, oh um, by the way, what happened that year? 
Oh yeah, <laughs> COVID <laughs> surprise. <laughs> uh, so I had found this practice. I was in Birmingham in residency. This practice was up in Virginia. I needed to go see it. So I called the broker, set a time aside, and I left clinic one night, Friday at 7 p.m., drove from Birmingham to Richmond through the night, showed up at 10 a.m. to meet the seller, changed clothes in a Hardee's parking lot, had bags under my eyes. It was awful. (laughs) But found a practice. It was exactly what I was looking for and tried to convince him that even though I wasn't going to graduate or finish my program for another six months, that he should take it off the market and hold it for me. Um, Fortunately, he agreed. He had some other offers, but I think we clicked personality wise and he really wanted someone who would keep his, the tradition of his practice going after he retired. So everything was going great. The banks told me to wait until three months before I finished to get my financing and then COVID hit. So nobody was lending money. So I I went to a ton of different banks. Um, I finally found the one bank that was actually lending and they approved me for a loan they did require, I purchased the real estate as well. So it was hundred percent financing for the practice through the bank, but they would only finance 80% and the seller financed the other 20% on the real estate. Oh, that's fantastic. Yes. He's been very good to me. And so with the staff, how much, how many staff people did you inherit? I inherited four. And how many, how many are still with you? Three of them, actually. Three. Of them. I kept okay. my both hygienists and my lead assistant. They've okay. been tremendous. So what has been the biggest thing that you've learned in the year and a half or so that you've owned the practice that you would have never thought that you would, that has never crossed your mind. You were never thinking about when you were in residency. It's a good question. There are a lot of different lessons through ownership. I think leadership's a really cliche answer. Managing personalities has been tricky. I am so young in comparison to my employees. Most of them are in their fifties. So I am basically their son, yet I had to come in and take over for a dentist who'd been there 35 years. And all of a sudden I'm in control. I I say control in air quotes. So just gaining their trust, learning how to manage personalities and conflicts, um, all while focusing on the clinical side. It's not, it's not something you can really prepare for until you're in it. Yeah. I mean, people are the biggest issue. Uh, They're the biggest blessing and the biggest curse when you're owning a business. They can drive you insane or help you sleep well at night. And, and so it's usually both. <laughs> yeah, yes. So have there been like what type of bumps in the road have you had in the transition from the seller to you owning the practice now? Were there any issues with patients? What all is did you was there a, did you lose a bunch of patients? Talk about some of the bump the bumps in the road. The patients for the most part were really understanding. They didn't realize how old the retiring dentist was. So it kind of caught them off guard. We did send out a transition letter before we, before we did the whole transition, but it was kind of a clean break. He stopped seeing patients a Thursday. I came in on Monday and started. I, I didn't want there to be both of us there at the same time. And the team didn't know who to look for, for leadership. So patients, we lost a few, um, but most of them were willing to give me a chance. Tricky part was getting credentialed with insurance because it was such a long process and they were understaffed with COVID, it took me about eight months to get fully credentialed with all the insurance plans that he was a part of. So having that conversation with patients saying, yes, we're probably going to be in network with them, but right now you're out of network. When patients hear that, their brain kind of stops working and they panic. So we did lose a few from that. Now, and so you've owned the practice about a year and a half. Is that right? A little less than that, but yes. And so you have more than doubled the production the time you've been there. Is that correct? Fortunately, I've been very blessed. And so what has been the key to that? There hasn't really been a magic switch that I flipped. I didn't really introduce a ton of different types of treatment. It's not like, oh, now we're doing a ton of implants and full mouth cases. Honestly, nothing against the previous dentist. He apparently didn't talk to patients very much. He would just kind of come in the room do what you need to do and leave. It was very quick. I like talking to people and I think it's important to build those relationships and patients just kind of been blown away. Just the fact that I spend an extra two minutes when they come in to get their teeth clean, all of a sudden we have that trust and I just tell them what we see. I got intraoral cameras and I'm able to show them what they need and that patients have really been responsive to it. Wow. Now, how old was the, the dentist that you bought from? 
72. Okay. So it's the little things. It's, you know, the bedside manner you hear about in the physician world, the bedside manner or the bed, the, the uh, chair side manner in the dentist world is, is a big deal. And I'm sure he had it before. He probably just, as he got older, probably just got tired of doing it. And obviously it's paying dividends beyond what you could have ever imagined. Definitely. So what's the, been the biggest positive surprise for you in owning a practice? This is a financial podcast. So financially <laughs> it's been, <laughs> I had goals I wanted to reach and, and certain milestones. The first five months, I was not on track to meet anything at all. I was not sleeping. I was working 15 hour days, stress out of my mind. And then all of a sudden things just kind of clicked and things started going well. And financially, just being able to see the practice grow and the numbers keep going up every month. I think that was the, the most pleasant surprise. It was one I wish I, I had hoped for, but actually seeing it come to fruition has been great. Yeah, that's that's exciting. Have you been able to, uh, have you learned how to delegate well? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, it's, I've gotten better. I'm a, a peacemaker. Uh, it's hard for me to to really be perceived as someone who is telling someone what to do and be really assertive and I guess, quote, mean, but I have realized that people want to be, want to have their skills maximized. So I'm trying to learn to feel comfortable with what I actually have to do versus what I can have someone else do and just take the time to teach them. But no, it, it, it's been a process. Yeah, that's, uh, it's always, it's, it's always an opportunity to, to learn. It's, you know, I have that challenge as well. Now, um, you know, obviously your, your practice is almost 18 months old, so it's new. So you're very heavy working in the practice. Um, yes. but how are you handling the, the, the tension of working on the practice versus working in the practice? Because we, I've talked about this with lots of people on the podcast is that, uh, you know, if you own a dental practice, it's a phenomenal wealth creator, but some people, really own a job, not that it's a bad job, it's a good job, but some people are truly business owners who just happen to be dentists and the income for those people tends to be much higher. How have you, have you been able to separate working in versus on it? Are you been to that point yet? It depends on what week you ask me. <laughs> At first, it, like I was saying, it, it was overwhelming um, just trying to make it day by day. Now that things have slowed down, I work Monday through Thursday. So I have my Fridays to kind of refocus I have probably about a 40 minute commute. So I'm constantly listening to business uh, audiobooks, podcasts, trying to just replenish myself and come up with a, a new idea. Um, I, I do try and take about a month ago, I went out in the woods in a, a log cabin with no electricity, no running water, and just spent three days there just writing and, and trying to plan for the upcoming year and figure out where I'd been. That's so pretty those cool. Types of that's pretty yeah, cool. Just kind of going, getting away. So uh, are you an outdoorsman type? I am. I'm an Eagle Scout. Um, I don't get away as much as I'd like, but yes, that's where I'm happy. So obviously you wisely chose it not in the winter time, <laughs> <laughs> but like, yes. did you take a bunch of gallons of water or did you get to have like a water filter and you went down to the creek or the river and drank that way? A little bit of both. It was a place I could take my car to. And not have too much of a hike. So I, I mostly carried my water in, but had a life straw just in case. Yeah. I did plan it when it was a University of Georgia bye week. So I didn't oh, miss there, anything. There, <laughs> there, there, there you go. But that's actually pretty wise. I mean, I've, I have some friends who, who every year will kind of almost kind of like go away for three days and just kind of prepare, you know, I'll make the excuse and say that I've got five kids. So there's no way that uh, that's even possible. Maybe that's an excuse. <laughs> Maybe that's a real life. But it does, you know, it, it, it's nice to get away from the distraction. Of course, the key, like you did, is to make not take your phone. You don't want to sit there for three days and just be playing on your phone the whole time. So, um, so what would you say the most important thing for someone in their last year of residence and their last year of dental school or in a year of residency? What's the most important thing for them to, to kind of consider? I think with the way dental school is structured, you learn patient care. You're an expert in that. I think figuring out where you want to be in five to 10 years and then actually planning to get there is really beneficial because it's really tempting. You get this contract offer as an associate, 
you see the number, you're like, man, that's more money than I've ever made in my whole life. Let's just do it. And for me, my biggest fear was getting into an associate job that was just good enough where I was comfortable and I would never leave. And I would never take that next step. Wow. So you have to know if you want to be an owner, plan. It, you can be an associate. There's nothing wrong with that. Learn a lot from, from the practice or practices you're at. But if you don't know where you want to end up, you're never going to get there. A little bit of a twist on this question, the last question. What advice would you give to a brand new dental school graduate? Yes, you've made it, but you haven't made it. I have a lot of classmates um, and just people I see who are, who are young dentists. They were in school for four years in college. Some did a, a year or two in between, at least four years of dental school, maybe residency. They see all their friends from college working jobs, going on trips. They have their life kind of moving forward, whereas we've kind of had this delayed gratification. And then you graduate, you're a dentist, you have the letters after your name, and then you think, I've made it. I need to treat myself. I need to live like a doctor. They buy the nice watch, the new car, the new house. And then with student loans on top of that, you're kind of stuck. It's almost as if you hadn't even gone to dental school with the amount of money you take home. So I would say, yes, you, you can get there, but be careful. Make sure that you, you kind of work your way up. Maybe treat yourself a little bit, but live more like a student as long as you can. It's what I call lifestyle creep. Expenses rise to meet income unless you uh, plan appropriately. So you said you read a lot of books, what audiobooks or books. What books, what are some good books you what, What's the best book you've read recently? Oh, I know we're talking about business books. Best you book could, of all you, time. You, you could talk Dune. anybody. <laughs> Dune. Dune. Movie just came out. It's my favorite book growing up. Mind blown with the movie. But as far as business books go, I really love Grit by Angela Duckworth. That is one of my all times. I recommend that to everybody. I feel like everyone should read that every year, especially I don't have kids right now. I want my kids to read it. I think it's just a a great mindset builder. The power of habit has been really beneficial for me. Charles Duhigg Duhigg? Duhigg or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just little disciplines that get you from point A to point B as best as possible. But I, I could go through a ton, but those are two that kind of stand out. So let's go back to Dune. I, I don't read not I don't read fiction. So <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm bad for that. But what is is it? The movie just came out, or it's just coming out? Yes, it just came out in October. It was written in the '60s, and it was kind of the foundation for Star Wars, Star Trek. Um, it's kind of Game of Thrones in space. Is the best way I can describe it. And who started the movie? Everybody. Um, <laughs> Timothy Chalamet, Javier Bardem, oh, wow. Becca Ferguson, um, Jason Momoa go for, for ages. They're, it's a stellar cast. Oh, wow. So is there any last comments or thoughts you'd like to share before we wrap this up? I think it's really beneficial for people to have conversations with professionals like you, not shameless plug. I think that I have a, a dental specific attorney, CPA financial advisor, planner, and I only know so much and the do-it-yourself approach works for some people. I like having guidance and making sure I'm kind of checking the boxes as I go. It's an investment, but I think that they are one of the main reasons I'm here today. So I'm I'm very grateful for, for you and people like you who make our lives easier. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. There are I mean, there are some people who can do it on their own, but there are some things, even for the do-it-yourselfers, there are some things that they aren't always aware of that people in the in the in the financial space are aware of, and so there's benefit from talking with those people. But I, so I, I appreciate you saying that. So, uh, Daniel, this has been fantastic. This has been different, but it's been good for people to hear something somebody on the front end and not on the back end. We've talked to retired dentists. We've talked to dentists making a couple million dollars. We've talked to uh, all sorts of people. We've never talked to a brand new dentist who started his practice. So this is, this is a very good, a, a real good episode. So I'm excited about this. So thanks so much. It's been really interesting talking to you today. And thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's been a blast. All right, everyone. We'll see you next week. You've been listening to the Financial uh, Flossing Podcast with Ross Brannon. This has been another episode of Financial Flossing with Ross Brannon, guiding dental professionals to a brighter future. 
If you liked what you heard, consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. For more on Ross Brannan, visit rossbrannan.com. Registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities, LLC, PAS, OSJ, 3664 Coolidge Court, Tallahassee, Florida, 32311, 850-562-9075. Securities products and advisory services offered through PAS, member FINRA, SIPC. Financial representative of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, New York, New York. PAS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian. North Florida Financial is not an affiliate or subsidiary of PAS or Guardian. California Insurance License Number 0L10073. Arkansas Insurance License Number 16139032. 2021 1195.35. Expires 423. That last part can also say 2021. 1195.35, expiration April 2023. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Guest speakers and their firms are not affiliated with or endorsed by PAS, Guardian, or North Florida Financial and opinions stated are their own. Ross is a registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities, LLC, PAS, OSJ, 3664, Coolidge Court, Tallahassee, Florida, 32311, 850-562-9075. Securities, products, and advisory services offered through PAS, member FINRA, SIPC, financial representative of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, New York, New York. PAS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian, North Florida Financial is not an affiliate or subsidiary of PAS or Guardian. Arkansas Insurance License Number 16139032. California Insurance License Number 0L10073. 2021 130215. Expiration 1123.